Good morning. Happy Easter to all of you. Thank you for being here today. Today we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And because Jesus is alive, we can all have new life too. Isn't that exciting? We continue in our study, the book of Acts. Acts is the fifth book in the New Testament. The book of Acts to the ends of the earth. The Acts of the Holy Spirit through His church. Today is part 38. Our scripture is Acts 19, verses 8 through 10, and verse 20, if you would like to follow along in your Bible. An open door represents an opportunity. And a closed door represents opportunity denied. And God can open a door that no one else can close. And God can close a door that no one else can open. But was it God who opened or closed your door? And today we're going to look at some scriptural principles that will help us to discern the truth. But the greatest door ever, ever opened to us is God's personal invitation to have a relationship with our Creator and that is made possible by the open door at the cross. That's made possible by the open door of the empty tomb. And thank God for the doors that he opens for us. But also thank God for the doors he closes. The Apostle Paul said in Colossians, Pray also for us that God may open a door to us. And so again, today we celebrate the open door of the resurrection. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the very heart of Christianity. Acts chapter 19 and verse 8. Paul went into the synagogue. Now the apostle Paul was a missionary of the gospel. The gospel is the good news that Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sin. And that on the third day... Jesus rose from the dead victorious over sin and death. And Paul was going from city to city to city telling everyone about the good news of Jesus. Now in our story today, Paul is in the city of Ephesus. Ephesus is a Greek city. It's an important center of trade in the Mediterranean. And he's there preaching the gospel. Verse 8, Paul went into the synagogue. God had opened the door... For Paul to share the gospel in a synagogue in Ephesus. Now the synagogue was a building that the Jewish people used for religious worship and for religious instruction. And since Paul was Jewish himself, it was a natural place for him to hang out. Verse 8, Paul went into the synagogue and spoke out boldly for three months. Now to speak boldly means that he did not fear what people might think or what people might say about him. He was committed to speak the truth and to speak it with grace, no matter what the consequences. And most of us today could probably use a little extra boldness in our faith. And Paul continued to speak boldly in the synagogue for three months. Verse 8, he talked with the people and persuaded them to accept the things he said about the kingdom of God. God opened the door for Paul to share the good news. And the word persuade here means to convince. And they listened to the truth that Paul presented from the Old Testament scriptures. And he showed them how Jesus Christ was their promised Messiah. And many of them listened and many of them believed, but not all of them. Verse 9. But some of them became stubborn. In other words, when they heard the good news, their heart became hard and closed to the truth. You see, to accept the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ requires a heart that is receptive and a heart that is open to the truth. And it requires us to have a spirit of humility in order for us to agree with God that we are sinners in need of a Savior. P. 
people become stubborn when they allow their pride to rule their heart. Verse 9. They refused to believe and said evil things about the way of Jesus before all the people. They made a conscious decision to reject the truth that they'd heard. But not only did they refuse to believe, but they expressed their unbelief by choosing to slander the good news of the gospel. In other words, they made up bad things to say about the way of Jesus. The way was an early name for Christianity. Verse 9. So Paul left them. In other words, God closed the door. But why would God close a door after three months of good stuff happening? Verse 9. So Paul left them. Taking the followers with him, he went to the school of a man named Tyrannus. And just as God closed the door in the synagogue in Ephesus, God opens the door at the school of Tyrannus. You see, the synagogue was an exclusive place just for certain people. But the school was a public place, a lecture hall, where everyone was welcome and everyone could hear the gospel. You know, sometimes God will close a door for us that seems to be okay so that he can open the best door for us. And that's what happened with Paul. Verse 10, there Paul talked with people every day for two years. Now, Paul could have been content in the comfort and security of the synagogue. Those were his people. He knew them and he understood them. Paul could have gotten angry about the closed door. But because Paul trusted God, in addition to three months of ministry at the synagogue, God brought two years of amazing life change at the school. And here's the result when God opens the best doors for us and we trust him enough by faith to walk through. Verse 10, because of his work, every Jew and every Greek in Asia heard the word of the Lord. Verse 20, so in a powerful way, the word of the Lord kept spreading and kept growing. There is no end to the amazing things God can do in our life when we simply learn to trust in him with all of our heart. Instead of leaning on our own understanding, which is what most of us do most of the time. Just because something seems good on the surface, it does not mean that God has opened that door. And just because an open door might seem a little shaky, that doesn't necessarily mean that you should not walk through it. So how can we determine... If an opportunity really is an open door from God. And we certainly don't want to miss the joy that we find when we live in God's perfect will for our life. But we also know that every opportunity that comes our way is not an open door from God. Following God is a life of faith. Having everything guaranteed up front before we'll take the first step is not a life of faith. Scripture tells us in Hebrews, without faith, no one can please God. Anyone who comes to God must believe that he is real and that he rewards those who truly want to find him. So, do you want to walk by faith? today do you want to have the courage to step through the door that God is holding open for you but how can we know that it's God who opened the door and here's the key you must spend enough time with God that you learn to know his voice when he speaks and we get to know God by meditating on his word we get to know God by spending quality time with Him in prayer. 
And that's why Jesus taught us how to pray. The disciples came to Jesus and they didn't ask him to teach them how to preach. They didn't ask him to teach, him how to do, teach them how to do miracles. They said, teach us to pray. He didn't just want us to memorize and recite some words that don't mean anything to us. Jesus taught us that when we pray, we should remember these seven things. We are invited to a relationship with God. Number two, always honor God's name. Number three, God is in control. Number four, we can depend on God. Number five, we all need forgiveness. Number six, we must all be forgivers. And number seven, we all need spiritual guardrails in our life. And Jesus said to pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven. The Lord's Prayer teaches us that we are invited into a relationship with God. Always remember that as a Christian, we are part of God's family. When we have a relationship with someone, it's natural for us to simply talk with them. And that's what prayer is. Communicating with God. We talk with Him and we listen as He talks with us. And it's good for us to remember that when we pray, we are talking with our Heavenly Father who loves us. And listening to our Heavenly Father who wants the very best thing for us. Prayer is not a spiritual show. Prayer is not a performance. Prayer is a personal conversation with God. And you don't do all the talking. Make sure you do some listening. Number one, the Lord's Prayer teaches us we are invited to a relationship with God. Number two, the Lord's Prayer teaches us to always honor God's name. Jesus prayed, hallowed be thy name. Hallow is not a word we use a lot today, but it means holy. It means exalted. It means honored. And the best way for us to honor God's name is not to use it selfishly. There are many of us who would never, ever dream of swearing and using God's name in vain. But still, we use his name in vain all of the time. We need to be very careful about what we attach God's name to. Church people. I love church people. I am one. But sometimes they concern me. Church people have learned that we can attach God's name to something that we want to do. And then people will leave us alone. If you say that God told me to do something, then who am I to argue with what God said, right? Even if I know it's something you should not do. Does God speak to us? Yes. How do I know it's His voice? By spending time in His Word. By spending time in prayer. And by seeking wise counsel from godly people. Number one, the Lord's Prayer teaches us we are invited to a relationship with God. Number two, the Lord's Prayer teaches us to always honor God's name. And number three, the Lord's Prayer teaches us that God is in control. Jesus prayed, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now most of us believe that I alone determine the direction of my own life. That I determine my destiny. That I decide my future. That I lay out the plans for my life. In other words, if we're going to be honest this morning, I am in control. And so your version of the Lord's Prayer would read something like this. My kingdom come. And my 
will be done. And all through the scriptures, we can read story after story of people who chose to do things their own way. And they said, I am in control of my life, not you, God. And then we read their story of heartbreak and destruction, which comes every time we try to do things our way. When we pray, thy kingdom come. When we pray, thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth, we are acknowledging the importance of God in our everyday life. We are trusting Him with the big decisions, but also with the little stuff. God is always looking for people who will say to Him, I trust you completely. I'm all in. I want your way, not mine. I want to surrender to you, God. You become stronger only when you become weaker. When you surrender your will to God, you will find the strength to do what God has asked you to do. The Christian life is centered on this, that God is the absolute owner of it all. And it's amazing. It's amazing the things that God can do through a life that's surrendered to Him. It's when we acknowledge God is in control. Number four, the Lord's Prayer teaches us to depend on God. Jesus prayed, give us day by day our daily bread. Trusting in, depending on God is easy when life is good. But it's during those times when we cannot see what God is doing that can be difficult for us. It's then that we can see God working and providing even the most basic needs in our life. You see, God has promised to meet your every need. And God always keeps his promises. So he encourages us to ask for our daily bread. And then to trust Him to, to supply our every need. Number five. The Lord's Prayer teaches us that we all need forgiveness. Jesus prayed and forgive us our sins. Now Jesus didn't need to pray this because He was perfect. He was showing us how we need to pray because we're not. An important part of our daily bread that we just talked about. It's important. In fact, some of us are so hungry right now, you're having a hard time listening to me <laughs> because your mind is on lunch. That's how important our physical needs are. For most of us, our physical needs rule our life. But how much more important are our spiritual needs? And the greatest spiritual need that we all have is forgiveness. Because without forgiveness, we face divine judgment. And you don't want that. Yes, our God is a God of grace, a God of love, a God of mercy. Thank God for that. But there are still some very serious realities that every person has to deal with. Romans 6.23, the scripture says, For the wages of sin is death. The payment for sin is death. You see, sin is alive and well. It's fun. It's tempting. But it comes with a price. And it's a big price. Scriptures say it's death. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that gift to us was paid for on the cross by Jesus. And the fact that Jesus wants us to pray and forgive us our sins tells us that it's his desire to forgive us. And so how can we have forgiveness today? 1 John 1 9 If we confess our sin he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To confess means to own up to it. 
To confess means to turn away from it. To confess means to repent. And God promises forgiveness. Number six, the Lord's Prayer teaches us that we all need to be forgivers. Jesus prayed, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Now in the Greek, that means everyone. Yeah, but what about, there's this one person, God, that, well, you, you take that up with him. He tells us everyone. You know, when someone hurts us, it's like they have taken something away from us. It might be your happiness. It might have been your first marriage. It might be your reputation. It might be a friendship. And they've taken something of value from me. And so I think they owe me. And it might even be something they can never, ever pay back, even if they wanted to. But you still believe they owe me. And so I've decided I'm going to hold that grudge and I'm going to hold it tight because after all, it's only fair that they pay me back. So I've decided I'm not going to forgive because they do not deserve forgiveness. They never do. If you only knew what they did to me. If you only knew what they said about me. If you only knew what they took from me, then you would agree that I should never forgive. Because to forgive is to let them off the hook. And that would not be fair. I only want what's fair. And so our world today is full of bitter, angry people demanding that they get paid back. You see, the price of unforgiveness is huge. It's huge on you. It's too big for you to pay. And since when does me not forgiving someone hurt them? It doesn't. It only hurts me. And there are some of us who have some things against someone and you will not let it go. Because you are convinced that you are right. And you probably are. Forgiveness. Is one of the most beautiful gifts. We can ever give someone. You see forgiveness is pure love. Forgiveness sets us free. And it's when I choose to forgive. I am the most like Jesus. And so the choice to forgive is in my hands, not theirs. And I simply decide to cancel the debt and say to them, you do not owe me anymore. I'm not saying that it doesn't matter. I'm not saying that they are right. I'm not saying that my hurt is not real because it is. But I am saying that you do not owe me anymore and thank God that's exactly what Jesus said to us on the cross number seven the Lord's prayer teaches us that we all need spiritual guardrails in our life to protect us you see the fool refuses to have spiritual guardrails in his life Jesus prayed and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus said, in this world you're going to have trouble. And there will be many tests and many trials that will come your way. And it's God's intention for these things, these tests, these trials, to strengthen our faith. And we are to pray that these tests... And these trials do not overcome us and do not become a temptation to sin. And the practical way for all of us to protect ourselves from that is for us to intentionally set up spiritual guardrails in our life. These guardrails are 
personal. This is something you pray about and decide for yourself. Your guardrails may be different from mine. Your guardrails might seem foolish to someone else. And they'll make fun of you, but that doesn't matter. You pray about your spiritual guardrails. And set them up in advance. These spiritual guardrails are placed in your life in such a way to protect you from the danger zone. Jesus taught us that when we pray, we should remember these things. We are invited into a relationship with God. Always honor God's name. God is in control. We can depend on Him. We all need forgiveness. We all must be forgivers. We all need spiritual guardrails. The Lord's Prayer. I quote it every day. I'm not telling you to, but I do. But it's so much more than something we simply quote without ever considering what it means. And when you pray, pray from your heart to God. Thanking Him for a relationship that honors His name. Realizing that God is in control and we can depend on Him. And that all of us need forgiveness. And that we must all be forgivers. And that we all need spiritual guardrails to protect us in our life. You see, God can open a door that no one else can close. God can close a door that no one else can open. But how can we know if it was God who opened and closed our door? Three things. Spend enough time with God that you learn to know His voice. Pray like Jesus taught us to pray. Number two, the door that God opens will agree with the teaching of Scripture. God will never lead you. God will never open a door for you to do something that is forbidden in Scripture. Well, God told me to move in with Him. No, He didn't. Number three, the door that God opens will be supported with godly counsel. When God opens the door, your decision will be confirmed by people who love God and who love you. And if that's not there, God did not open that door. Listen. Meditate. Seek. And trust. Today we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thank God for the open door at the empty tomb. Because Jesus is alive. We can also have new life today. God bless you. Living with uncertainty can take its toll. The normal day-to-day is replaced with fear, worry, doubt. When our normal is disrupted, our surroundings begin to feel weak. Foundations begin to rattle. Our lives become disoriented. As time goes on, we begin to lose sight of the one constant on our journey. Jesus. The fear is consuming. The worry, draining. The doubt, painful. Even in our darkest moments, when the last thread of hope has unraveled from our being, we must dwell on truth. We must remember, no matter what is happening around us, God is still sovereign. Today, let us dwell on the truth of Easter. The stone has been rolled away. 
The grave has been rendered powerless. Death has transformed to life. In our fear, He is still risen. In our worry, He is still victorious. In our doubt, He is still alive. When everything seems hopeless, the hope of Easter remains.